feel free. <laughs> I know I will. Well, hell. This is very helpful, thank you. <laughs> Sahel. Someone had to say that word from the pulpit and really mean it one day or another, so it might as well be me. You are important and you are needed. You are important to each other in the forging and keeping of faith and friendships and you are needed by the community you serve. You have a purpose and I'll finish that statement at the end, if I make it there. Sarah has a benediction up her sleeve, sleeve in case I run out of the room at any moment. <laughs> so I want to try to tell you a personal story. And I once started to tell it at um, an open and affirming anniversary event when Bill Johnson was here, but it just felt too raw. And I treated it more humorously so that I wouldn't break down. I wanted to be a minister since I was 11. My parents joined uh, First Congregational Church of Binghamton at roughly the same time that Janice Johnson and her family joined the church. And I remember looking up as a kid and seeing Janice singing in our choir. Uh, you are important to me for a lot of reasons, Janice. Dr. Gamble was such a figure of respect in our community, and he was kind to me. When he was killed in a car crash returning from Philadelphia early in the morning, and I saw the hole he left behind in his absence, I resolved to follow his footsteps. Later, it became clear who I was as a gay man, and I left the dream behind me when I understood just how little the Christian church did not want me. Because good, straight allies work to change things, I ended up in seminary. And I became a leader at the First Congregational Church of Los Angeles, and then I interned, followed by a small staff position there. And then came the Ecclesiastical Council. This is where churches from all over come to uh, meet the candidate for ordination, ask questions, and then vote on ordination. And the progressives thought I was so much of a shoe-in that they didn't bother to show up. A church in Redlands and another one nearby made sure the word got out that a gay man was going to be ordained, and they sent people to vote. After a lengthy inquisition and an even more lengthy discussion behind closed doors, I was called back in and I was told that I would not be endorsed for ordination. Never happened that I know of. I asked why and what the moderator said made no sense. She was embarrassed. And so I asked again and she sheepishly told me, they don't like your lifestyle. Members of my congregation were appalled and I found my voice that day. And so I walked up into that pulpit and I asked Carl to please stand and I introduced him for who he was to me. And Carl said, I'm not just going to stand, I'm gonna come up there so that you can all see who we are. A very proud moment, one of many for my spouse. I said, no, I will be ordained. And since I didn't have the power to make good on that decision, <laughs> my senior pastor stood up, Steve Berry, and announced my ordination at the church on June 7, and that everyone was invited. I wasn't ordained by a denomination. I was ordained by a church that took a stand. I am the only... I'm the only pastor I know of in our conference 
who didn't pass his ecclesiastical council. And somehow I managed to be called to the best church in the conference. Go figure. I'm so proud of this church. And by the way, Pastor Sarah's ecclesiastical council is not far away, and I have reassured her that her experience will be nothing like mine <laughs> whatsoever. And this is why we would invite some of you to come down that day to support her. It will be just outside of San Diego. It continued. I was handed a note at my ordination service before the processional. Oh, this church had long processionals with the choir and the deacons and lots of pomp. And there I was at the back of the line, handed a note that said that I was subverting the will of Jesus Christ by putting forth my own homosexual agenda, which I didn't even know I could do. <laughs> From there, I was a candidate at First Congregational Santa Ana, and the search committee didn't really have all of the advice I suppose they should have in what to do, and so they decided it would be a good tactic not to tell the congregation that a gay man was their candidate. And so that Sunday I came in and I preached and uh, people at the door said, thank you for being with us today. I was ushered to a room where eventually Carl and I heard loud arguments and crying and it went on for some time. And I wasn't surprised to hear that I did not make the call to that church I held some anger about it for a long time until I realized that that church split over this issue and had suffered a lot of pain themselves. So I, I hold them dear now. All of this is to say that an understanding of what it feels like to be marginalized and not accepted, especially in a place that is supposedly to be a sanctuary where people learn that God loves them. This has colored my entire ministry. Love, acceptance, making the circle wider. These are themes that I repeat over and over and over until I wonder if you don't get sick of me saying them. And now I know that in one way or another, it is the experience of so many of you as well for different reasons. Not being accepted because of X, Y, or Z. It doesn't really matter. But this is why you matter. And this is why you are important. And this is why many people come to this place and stay. Today's scripture is from the same chapter of Luke that we left off with on Christmas Eve. But now Jesus is 12 years old. Uh, Luke tends to compartmentalize a little bit. Jesus remaining in the temple and scaring Mary and Joseph is disobedience. But that disobedience turns constructive. What would it look like for our church to continue to be disobedient in a constructive way going forward? Will we continue to oppose a culture that demonizes LGBT people or immigrants or Muslim or one that allows homelessness and great privilege and children who go to bed hungry and people incarcerated because they fled the violence like Mary and Joseph and Jesus did into Egypt? Will we be disobedient to a culture that continues to degrade our environment, all of which begins with the degradation of our culture? The story of Jesus in the temple as a boy offers a number of directions. And Shantia, a colleague in Cleveland, advised me, pastor to pastor, that we should be where God wants us to be, even if it doesn't make sense at the time. She said, we are called into ministry and we are called out of ministry. Shantia says, the story about Jesus only made sense later and not at the time when he has wandered away from his parents, and you know, most of life is like that. You live it forward and you understand it backward. And God's handiwork is usually obvious in retrospect. 
Think of some of the things that we have done in this time together. Good things, responding to Prop 8, being ground zero, in fact, for the anti-8 Prop 8 group. The blessing of the Quran at the same time someone was threatening to burn one, taking on our city council when they gratuitously removed the living wage ordinance right here in Irvine. Walking as a church in marches, being present at vigils, opening our space to like-minded groups who are working for justice, sponsoring high-profile speakers who enlightened us in our community in any number of topics, particularly, of course, progressive Christianity. We provide opportunities for learning and service for our youngest people. We even built a building because we needed one to house our growing activity. These are the great challenges and changes we've endured together, times when no one might be sure what was going to happen next, and yet it all worked. Risk something big for something good, William Sloan Coffin once said. Risk something big for something good. All things work together for the good of those who are lovers of God and are called. I have watched in this church our kids, without exception, grow from their baptism or toddlerhood into startlingly smart youth and young adults with a healthy worldview and a love of faith and community and this now is the parent approach to this text today. Our children, as you know, are ours only for a short time. Joseph and Mary were terrified and they were probably troubled by Jesus' growing independence. He was quickly moving behind them like all children do. And the same is true for pastors and their congregations. We lead and we nurture them until they get to the point that they either grow beyond us and they need the next pastor or a time comes from, for any number of reasons that we have to go. It is uh, hard to leave, but it's necessary for growth. Whoever the next pastor is, whoever she might be, she will know what to do, or whoever he may be, you will be loved as I love you. As the Buddhists say, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. You are important and you are needed. You are important to each other in the forging and keeping of faith and friendships and needed by the community that you serve. Oh God, please someone say something funny. <laughs> I'll go with that I have no idea what or why but I'll go with that you have a purpose you are exactly the church the right church at exactly the right time you need to know it and you need to believe it you are rooted deeply now and have borne exactly the right truth in every stance and in every statement and in our inward expression of community that keeps you, the spirit-filled people that you are. Look at your church in retrospect. Look at the history of it. On every side we took, it was the right side that history showed to be. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he states, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Now, so many people have said goodbye to me at the door that I need to remind you that I will be back next week and for five, 
five more months, and we can only do the long goodbye for so long, so thank you for the continuing privilege of being your pastor for what will be 13 years. I love you all.